Greetings, Earthlings, and welcome back to the 2020 Podcastage Gift Guide. This is going to be slightly different from the last version I did, where I broke down all of the gifts based on price point. Here I'm going to break down the gifts into categories, for instance, microphones for podcasters, microphones for musicians, interfaces, cables, shock mounts, pop filters, stands, accessories, blah, 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 blah. That way, if you're shopping for a musician, you don't have to listen to me ramble about microphones that are good for podcasters. If you just have somebody who needs a cable, you can jump right to that. If you want a bunch of stocking stuffers, you can go to the accessories section. I just thought this might be a more fun and hopefully more useful way to break down the video into categories. If you do want links to everything, I will have them in the description, and I will also have them at podcastage.guide. If you want to go to a website and see everything laid out much more pretty than it will be in the description down below, go ahead, go grab some popcorn, and let's dive into this. Number one, microphones for podcasters. First up, for 25 bucks, we have the Behringer XM8500. This is an XLR dynamic microphone, so you will need an XLR cable and an interface as well. But for 25 bucks, this thing hits way above its weight class. It sounds incredible. You could use this for your entire podcasting journey, and nobody will complain. 25 bucks, you're good to go. Second on the list is $70, and this is the Samson Q2U. This is both an XLR and a USB microphone. One of my most recommended microphones because it is so versatile. You can buy it, connect it to your computer over USB, then down the road when you want to upgrade, you can get an XLR cable, an interface, some outboard gear, and you don't have to replace it with a new microphone. So for the versatility and the upgrade path down the road, the Samson Q2U is my second pick. Next on the list goes for $100, and that is the SEV7. This is an outstanding handheld dynamic vocal microphone that works well for singing as well as for spoken word. And this has a tighter polar pattern compared to a lot of other dynamic microphones, meaning it will do a better job at rejecting a bit of the room noise. If there's a loud keyboard off to the side or a fan off to the side, this will do a better job than something like the SM58 at rejecting that. For 100 bucks, that's my pick. Next, we're jumping up in price to the $200 to $230 price point, and I am picking the Rode Procaster. This is a broadcast dynamic microphone. It does do a pretty poor job at plosive rejection, so you would need to get a pop filter as well. But as far as background noise rejection, this thing is incredible. So if the person you're shopping for is recording in a noisier environment and they want a crisp and full sound, the Rode Procaster would be my pick at $230-ish. Now we are getting into the stratosphere. We have $400 for the Shure SM7B, one of the most famous broadcast dynamic microphones of all time. To pull out a meme, it was used on Michael Jackson's Thriller. Although it was the Shure SM7, the original version, not this version, and quite different sounding, so I think that is unfair to use that. It is seen in many podcasting studios. It is a very quiet microphone, so you will need a good preamp or one of the inline preamps that I'll discuss a little bit later. But for the sound, if you want a darker, smoother, more natural, soothing sound, 100% recommend it. It's one of my all-time favorite mics. And last up on the list, we have a $450 pick. It is the Electro Voice RE20. This was my pick for the best spoken word microphone, and I selected it even though I personally prefer the SM7B more for my voice. The RE20, I believe, is a bit more universally accepted in terms of tone. It has a little bit more clarity up top. It is full down low, and it's not too overboosted. It doesn't sound unnatural or artificial. For 450 bucks, a really amazing microphone, and they did just release a blacked-out version of it. So if you don't like the puke green, you can get a great-looking matte black version of this. I don't think you could go wrong with that. Number two, microphones for musicians. 
First on the list is $25, and it is the Behringer XM8500 again. Are you all seeing a trend here? It's affordable for the price. It is outstanding. Is it going to give you the best sound that you have ever heard? Absolutely not. But it is affordable, and it will work. It works, and it sounds pretty dang good, and I do think it actually sounds better than many microphones that cost more than it. Next up on the list is a $90 microphone, and this is a condenser mic, the Neat Worker B. Neat is a company that I had not paid attention to prior to last year, and they became an independent company after buying themselves out from their owner. And the prices dropped significantly on the microphones, and the quality and sound that you're getting is... It's too good to be true, almost. It sounds way better than it should. But it is $90 for the Worker Bee, and if you can get your hands on it, absolutely, I recommend it. Works great on voice, instruments, everything that I threw at it, I loved it on. Third on the list, I was going to put the Neat King B. However, that is pretty much out of stock everywhere. So I am going to go with the $150 Audio Technica AT2035. I don't think this is the best microphone out there, but it is a functional microphone. It is well used and well known, and people seem to enjoy how it sounds for the most part. If somebody were to get the AT2035, they could record and have no issues whatsoever. If I'm not mistaken, I believe Billie Eilish at one point was using the AT2035. If it's good enough for Billie Eilish, it's good enough for all of us. That's my third pick. Next up on the list goes for $270, and it is the Rode NT1. Not the NT1A, not the NT2A, the NT1. It is the black version of the microphone. I adore this microphone more than I should. It is incredibly quiet, meaning the electronics inside don't generate a bunch of noise. It is relatively neutral, meaning you can EQ it easily in post to get the sound that you want in the mix that you're working on. And for the price, it just sounds outstanding. It would easily be one of the few microphones that I owned if I could only own a handful of mics. Absolutely outstanding for the price. Now we're getting up there and we are jumping to the $500 price point and I am selecting the SE Electronics SE4400A. This is a multi-pattern condenser microphone, kind of harkening back to the AKG 414s or 414s. I like this better. I think this is a smoother sound, much more pleasing sound, and less artificial sounding. If you are looking for a multi-pattern microphone for vocals, for instruments, for anything, this is the microphone I would go for if you're at the $500 price point. I absolutely adore this microphone and have no issues recommending it. And last up on the list goes for $1,000. It is the Austrian Audio OC818 or 818. Austrian Audio is a company that was started by XAKG employees. And this microphone blew the competition out of the water in terms of multi-pattern condenser microphones. I believe it outperforms the AKG 414s. I think it sounds better. I think the functionality and the versatility that they have built into this thing is incredible. It's future-proof. You have multiple capsules that you can output separately through different XLR ports and control the polar pattern in post. For the price, you are getting a lot. It is expensive. A thousand bucks is a lot of money, but this would easily be one of the last microphones you ever have to buy if you want a couple of mics in your mic locker. Absolutely outstanding. And as I said in my review, it's an instant classic. Number three, audio interfaces. First up goes for 50 bucks. It is the Behringer UM2. This is an incredibly affordable audio interface. Plastic build quality doesn't feel amazing, but the performance is surprisingly good. This really is the lowest that I would go in terms of recommending an audio interface because I do believe that it is a relatively reliable brand and a relatively reliable audio interface. 
if you just need a single XLR input and a quarter inch instrument input, this is what I would recommend to start with if you are on a budget. 50 bucks, Behringer UM2. Next up on the list, we're jumping up to $130, and it is the Audient Evo 4. This is a dual XLR input audio interface. Audient makes some of the best audio interfaces out there. The preamps are clean. The A to D conversion is excellent. And this has something called smart gain, meaning you can click a button, speak into your microphone, or play your guitar into the microphone, and it will set the gain of the interface appropriately. For a beginner, if you want a great sounding interface, this is what I would recommend. Really a stellar option, especially given the price. Next, we're jumping up to $220, and it is the Motu M2. As soon as I got this, it became one of my most recommended audio interfaces based on the price, the performance, and the functionality. I love having visual meters to see what is actually going into the interface and what is being played back. I love how clean the preamps are, how great the A to D conversion is, how great the headphone amp is. And I know it sounds silly, but it has an on off switch, which is something that I look for on pretty much everything I use. I absolutely adore this interface. One of the best, although I should admit there have been a couple of complaints that I've seen about the interfaces failing, but they have been able to get pretty good support from Motu directly. So keep that in mind when you're looking at who you're shopping for. We're jumping up only 60 bucks to the SSL 2 Plus. I am recommending this because SSL is a legendary audio company. They build consoles that are used in the biggest studios in the world. And with this, you're able to get a little bit of that sound in your studio at an affordable price. Amazing amounts of gain, very clean preamps. But the selling point is this 4K switch which gives you a little bit of that analog saturation. So in a world where everything is being done digitally and things can start to sound a little bit clinical and dry and boring, hitting that 4K switch and getting a little bit of dirt on the recording, a little bit of classic twang on it can be a really nice touch. So if you want to have two XLR inputs, some amazing preamps, and you want a little bit of color to your recordings, I'd go for the SSL 2 Plus. Next, we're doubling our price, but we are getting what we pay for. We're getting a lot of features, and it is the Focusrite 18i20 3rd Gen. The reason you would want this is it has five XLR inputs. If you have a podcast or if you're miking up drums and you need eight microphones going into your computer, 500 bucks. I don't think you can really complain much about what you're getting here. Eight preamps, which are relatively clean, and it's all going to individual channels. So you're able to mix and post. That's what sets this apart from a USB mixer. Most USB mixers down mix everything to a stereo track. This allows you to run every single mic to a separate channel in your recording software and mix and process and post. If that's what you're looking for, 500 bucks, you can't go wrong. But if you want to jump up in quality, you're going to be jumping up in price. For 800 bucks, I'm recommending the Arteria 8 Pre. Full disclosure, this was sent to me by Arteria to do a review of it, and I did that. The thing that I enjoy about this interface the most is how clean the preamps are, but right below that is the fact that you can run this as a USB audio interface if you just want to plug it directly into your computer. But if you have another audio interface and you want to expand the preamps for that other interface, like the Universal Audio Apollo Twin X, you want eight more preamps on that, you can run this as a data expansion. You can use this to expand another interface's preamps and run it directly through the Universal Audio console. It's amazing that you're able to do both of those things. If you're looking for really clean pre's and eight channels running into your computer, absolutely. If you want eight amazing pre's to expand an existing audio interface, absolutely, I recommend it. And lastly, the most expensive interface I'm recommending goes for $900. 
This is my main interface other than the X8, the Universal Audio Apollo Twin X. The reason you're buying into a Universal Audio interface is the DSP processing, meaning you're able to process your microphone in real time and you're able to get access to plugins and clones of analog gear that is prohibitively expensive. I can run my microphone through a $1,000 preamp on this thing into a $3,000 compressor into another $3,000 compressor into a $10,000 EQ, and it will cost me a fraction of all of that outboard analog gear. If that is what you're looking for, if you want amazing pre's, but more importantly, if you want access to those amazing analog gear emulations, and you want the ability to expand to up to, I believe, 10 inputs, the Twin X is exactly what I would pick. And this is my perfect audio interface if I didn't have all this extra unnecessary gear that I use. Number four, cables. First on the list goes for seven bucks. It is an Amazon Basics XLR to XLR cable. It doesn't really affect the sound that much at all. I didn't notice any difference. I measured it. I didn't see any difference, but I have had many people say they can hear the difference. I wasn't able to hear that difference, but in terms of rejection of noise, the Amazon Basics doesn't perform well. So if the person you're shopping for is recording in an area that has a lot of electromagnetic interference, if they're running their cables next to power cables or they have a radio station next door broadcasting, this would not be the pick for them. But if you're in a relatively quiet, you don't have much EMI or RFI in the studio, this is perfectly fine for the majority of people. Next on the list goes for 20 bucks. It is a Hosa XLR cable. It feels exponentially better than the Amazon Basics. It feels more durable, more robust. As far as RFI and EMI interference, it does a slightly better job at rejecting that not a world of difference, but it does feel as though if you are wrapping and unwrapping the cable a lot, this would last a lot longer than the Amazon Basics cable. So if you're in a static studio and leaving your cables alone and you don't have much RFI or EMI, Amazon Basics, that's what I'd recommend. But if you are wrapping and unwrapping the cables a lot, I'd recommend at least going with something like the Hosa. And last on the list goes for 50 bucks. It is the Mogami Gold XLR to XLR cable. These things are magical in terms of rejection of RFI and EMI. If I was running expensive gear, this is the cable that I would go with, or I would go with any cable that has Neutrik connectors, which are much more reliable and much less likely to get stuck in the gear that you're using. If you want one cable to plug in and forget it and never have to worry about it, or you want a durable, long-lasting, and lifetime warrantied cable, the Mogami Gold is what I'd pick for 50 bucks. Number five, shock mounts. First on the list goes for $50. It is the Audio-Technica AT8410A. This is great for shotgun microphones, or if you have a very slim dynamic or condenser microphone, this is a very great option. I use this with the Bayer Dynamic M201TG, and it works wonderfully for 60 bucks or 50 bucks rather. I think it's a great shock mount, and I have had zero issues with it. Next on the list, we're jumping up 10 bucks to the Audio Technica AT8415. Instead of a clip, this has elastic bands that you're able to shove the microphone into. You can position it using the yoke mount, and it works extremely well. Again, this is mainly going to be for more handheld dynamics or small diaphragm condensers or shotgun microphones. It's not going to work for standard side address condenser microphones. So for a smaller form factor mic, if you want the elastic bands as opposed to a microphone clip, more of a universal option, absolutely recommend the AT8415. And lastly, we are jumping up to $80. It is a Rycote Universal Shock Mount System. This is what I would recommend if you have any kind of regular condenser microphone. You can get this in multiple sizes depending on how wide the microphone you're mounting is. 
and it screws in from the side to mount the microphone and it reduces the shocks. It's built extremely well. It is a bit expensive, but it's one shock mount to rule them all. It will fit the majority of your microphones and do a great job at rejecting the bumps of your desk or the mic stand. Number six, we got them pop filters. First up on the list is eight bucks and it is an Amazon Basics standard pop filter. It's nylon, it's dual layer. The gooseneck on it is not the most sturdy. It will sloop over. It's not the most transparent. It's not my favorite pop filter, but for eight bucks, it's better than popping your microphone, potentially damaging the capsule or just destroying a recording. Next, we're jumping up quite a bit of money to $50 to the Stedman Pro Screen 101 or PS 101. This is a metal pop filter. Again, it's not the most transparent pop filter out there, but it does an outstanding job at rejecting plosives from hitting your microphone. It accomplishes this by redirecting the air away from the capsule. And if you got 50 bucks to spend, I would trust my microphones with this in front of it. I'm not gonna ruin a recording or a microphone with it. And lastly, we're doubling in price to $100 for the Hakan P110. I understand it looks silly. It looks like a fish filter. I understand it's extremely expensive, but this is a transparent pop filter. It doesn't affect the sound of the sound source you're putting in front of it. It allows the sound to come through while also rejecting the pops and the plosives from your voice or from whatever sound source is producing big puffs of air. So if you do want to get the most accurate sound with your pop filter, the P110 is the route that I would go. Number eight, microphone stands. We're starting at 12 bucks with the Amun MS-12 stand. If you're a traveler, if you want a small desktop stand, this is the one I would go with. It's sturdy enough to hold microphones up. It's built fairly well considering the price, and I have had it for multiple years and had no issues with it, holding even microphones like the RE20. For 12 bucks, I've got no complaints. Number two, for 20 bucks, we have a Neewer boom arm. This is one of the scissor microphone arms that you clip to the side of your desk. You place a microphone on it, you rotate it around. Now the microphone's right in front of you. You don't need it anymore, move it away. Is it amazing? No, it's got external springs. You can hear that if you bump it, that's gonna be annoying, but it's 20 bucks and it's one of the few options at this price point and it works well enough. Jumping up in price to $50, we have the Lix Pro scissor arm. It's very similar to the Neewer, but this is a much longer version of it. So if your desk is large, this may be the route to go. Again, it does have those external springs, so that will be obnoxious and it will be picked up if you bump them while you're recording. A nice trick, wrap some tape around the springs to dampen those a little bit. I learned that from a submariner, a submariner. Really nice hack, and for 50 bucks, you're getting a pretty decent and pretty usable microphone arm. Next, jumping up to $100, we have the Rode PSA-1. The big selling point here is the fact that it does not have external springs. You're not gonna run into that same issue as you do with the Neewer or the Lix Pro with the, the noisy springs in your recording and it works well. I've had this for five and a half years and it's still functioning for the most part and Rode has some of the best customer service out there. So if you're looking for a really high quality boom arm for a hundred bucks with great customer service and a relatively quiet performance, Rode PSA 1 is the route that I would go. Next, we're jumping up quite a bit in price to $320 to the Yellow Tech boom arm. These are the boom arms that you used to be able to see on the Joe Rogan experience. They look great, they perform well, they have a built-in XLR cable, which is a Mogami with Neutrik connectors, which you can get directly from them. You can buy it without the connectors and then put whatever connector you want on it, or you can buy it with the connectors from them and they will install that at the factory. Yes, it is a lot of money, 320 bucks, but this is great quality. No kind of noise in terms of springs internally. 
it rotates extremely easily. You can control the tension in the boom arm with a little bit of a screw all around. If you are looking for the last boom arm you will ever need, Yellow Tech is a great option. Jumping up even more, we're going to $350 for the Latch Lake Mic King 1100. This is a standard tripod microphone stand, but it is one of the most sturdy, durable, robust feeling mic stands I have ever encountered. It can hold a microphone and you don't have to worry about it tipping over. That is why I bought it. I have been testing out more expensive microphones and I want a mic stand that I will trust to not tip over or drop the mic that I invested so much money in. If you are looking for an incredibly sturdy microphone stand to maybe do some overhead micing for a drum kit, or you just want that extra vote of confidence that the mic stand is not going to drop your U87 or your whatever, the Latch Lake is a great option if you're looking for that floor stand. And lastly, for the microphone stands, we're jumping up to $400 to the OC White Ultima Low Profile Boom Arm Gen 2. I wasn't the biggest fan of Gen 1, kind of janky in areas where it shouldn't have been, given the price point. But with Gen 2, they have resolved all of that, and I adore this low-profile boom arm. If you're looking for a boom arm for video and you don't want the mic stand in frame like a Lix Pro or any kind of these overhead boom arms tend to do, this is the route that I would recommend. It has a cable system where you can route a cable through it. That's another reason why I use it, because I'm using a tube mic. I can't use the standard XLR that comes in the Yellow Tech, so that is why I am using it with this microphone. But it keeps the microphone off the desk. It has a tension adjust system depending on how heavy the microphone is, so you can get the microphone down low or up high if you want it up there. Really a great microphone system, especially when more and more people are rolling out video for their podcasts. Number eight, audio accessories. For 12 bucks, the first option is a microphone quick release that you just screw onto the microphone stand, then screw the other half into the microphone mount. Quick release, pop the microphone off, switch it out for whatever the heck you want. I use these all the time, absolutely amazing system, and it gives you a little bit of an extension if you have any issues with an XLR cable and the XLR plug on a microphone being in a weird place. Gives you a little bit of extra area there for the XLR cable to sit comfortably. Next up for 50 bucks, we have a Rolls microphone mute button. This is great if you want to have on the fly microphone mutes without having to go into a piece of software and mute your microphone or turn off phantom power or crank down the gain. Just a really quick click of the button will mute your microphone or attenuate it by 40 to 50 dB. If you were to be screaming, the audio would still come through the recording, so don't do that. But for quick coughs, this is a great option. And for live streamers, I think everybody needs a physical mute button for their mic. Jumping up to 75 bucks, this does not apply to everybody, but I am recommending the ISO Acoustics monitor stands. This ensures that your monitors are not vibrating the desk and adding a bunch of bass to the playback, which would affect how you're mixing your audio. Simple, straightforward, 75 bucks, and you get a much cleaner sound out of the monitors that you paid so much for. And lastly, for $100, I am recommending microphone activators, the Triton Audio Fethead or the SE Electronics Dynamite. Both of these will boost a dynamic microphone signal by around 25 dB by using the phantom power in your audio interface. If you have a quiet microphone like the SM7B and you just need a little bit of extra boost, something like the SE Dynamite or the Triton Audio Fethead would solve that issue, and they both work excellent. And number nine, miscellaneous items that people don't really think about getting for people, but make great stocking stuffers. First up on the list goes for three bucks, and it is a set of blank Altoid-style tins. 
I really enjoy these to store little knickknacks. I have one for my guitar picks. I have another for 5 8 to 3 8 inch microphone stands, stand adapters. Grab a set of these and a label maker, which we'll talk about shortly. And it cleans up your studio and keeps a lot of really easy to lose items easy to find. Number two goes for $10 and it is a field notes. Take some physical notes. You don't have to write everything on your phone. You don't have to write everything on your computer. Having physical notes can be really nice. You can write a little note. Hi, mom. I love you. And then just say, hey, mom, look what I wrote in my field notes today. See, I wrote that. You can do stuff like that. Number three goes for 12 bucks and it is a label maker so you can label your tins. That's all it really is, and gosh darn it, if they don't look really cool, you feel like a spy. You feel like a 1950s spy movie or a Men in Black style label maker. I love it. 12 bucks plus the 3 bucks for an Altoids tin, you're golden. Number four, 15 bucks for a Streamlight flashlight. I use this way more often than I should. The reason that I pick these is these are AAA powered, so you don't have any odd battery sizes. You can get some rechargeable AAAs or a pack of AAAs and be good to go with a flashlight. Absolutely love these things. Next, for 20 bucks, a Fisher Space Pen Bullet. If you want a compact pen to go with your field notes, this goes in the coin pocket of your jeans easily. The Fisher Space Pen Bullet writes amazingly well writes upside down, writes underwater, even though I don't think anybody has ever thought I'm drowning underwater, let me write a note, but in case you do need that, it does it. Next, I have lost count of what item we're at, but this is 30 bucks for a Braun travel clock. I don't know why I'm recommending this, I just like watches, and I thought it would be fun to have a little desk clock, an analog desk clock, and the Braun keeps excellent time at his quartz, but it has a sweeping hand motion, and it does have a little bit of a light, if you're reading in the night, if you need to see what time it is in the middle of the night in your studio when all the lights are off and everybody is vibing and recording, really a nice and fun desktop accessory. Next, for 50 bucks, I'm recommending an external hard drive. If you're doing video, if you're doing audio, you always run out of storage. Get something to store some cold files, stuff that you're not accessing regularly. Get an external hard drive to store all of that stuff and clear up the space on your local inbuilt hard drive or SSD so you can edit and process stuff much quicker. External hard drive, always useful. Jumping up 10 bucks, we have the Fisher Space Pen AG07. If you want a more substantial pen compared to the Bullet, this is the actual pen model that was used in space, and it is a fidget machine. Click it. It just, it's so much fun to play with all day long. You will annoy everybody else in the room. Uses the same ink cartridge as the Space Pen Bullet, but it is in the standard pen format size, and I adore this. I have pretty much gone exclusively to the AG07. I have two or three of them that I use all day, every day for my day job. Love these things. Highly recommend them. And lastly, for $100, I'm recommending an SSD if the hard drive is not your speed, if you want a little bit faster connection, a little bit faster read writes, the SSD is the route to go. It is a bit more expensive for less storage space, but you're getting faster read write speeds. If that is important to you, if you want to edit off of an external drive, the SSD is the route to go. I always have a couple extra SSDs around in case I need to have some external storage to edit off of. Love those things, and that is it. All right, I think that's going to wrap up for today. Thank you if you were still here. I know I just threw information at you through a fire hose. I understand that completely. Reminder, www.podcastage.guide, links to everything, and a little bit more information. If you found the video fun, interesting, or helpful, thumbs up, hated it, thumbs down. If you do want more videos, subscribe, logo down beneath me. I will do one of these in another two years, probably. I don't think there's enough that changes every single year. So in a couple of years, I'll do another one, and we can see how I approach it then. Let me know in the comments down below what I didn't include on the list that you think I should have, and I love you so much. I hope you have an amazing holiday season. I hope you get some time off. I hope you get to see your family, and you get to stay safe. I'll talk to you all later.